It was 3.20am on the 13th of July 1936 at 6 Manning Street, Newtown, a suburb of Geelong, Victoria. Manning Street then was a cul-de-sac, although it has been altered since. At 1am the street lights were turned off. A half moon was visible just above the eastern horizon. The quiet night was about to be disrupted. In the house, the Milne family were asleep, having retired early on Sunday evening. Mr and Mrs Milne in the front bedroom. Their two children, Clarice, aged 14, and Norman, who was nine years old, asleep in their rooms on the opposite side of the hallway. An older son, George, aged 21, lived away from home. In the front room, Amy Isabel Milne, who was a light sleeper, heard something heavy fall into the bedroom she shared with her husband, 47-year-old plainclothes constable Frederick Milne. She got out of bed to see what had happened, waking her husband as she did so. She saw an object with what looked like a burning fuse attached to it. She called out, Fred, I think it's a bomb. He yelled for his wife to go for safety. As the couple began to flee, a second bomb was hurled through the open bedroom window. Both devices detonated at the same time. Constable Milne, who hadn't even had time to get out of bed, felt himself being carried upwards towards the ceiling by the blast. The explosion was heard two miles away, with debris, including kapok from the bed, scattered over a wide area. Part of the house was found 20 yards away in a lane. The house shifted off its foundation. The front was torn away. The northern wall was blown several feet out, hitting a detached garage and half of the house collapsed, and a pall of smoke and dust that smelled of gunpowder wafted over the building as a small fire started, which was swiftly extinguished. The garage was crushed against a neighbouring house and collapsed onto a car parked inside. Furnishings from the front room had been flung out across the road and furniture in other rooms tipped over by the force of the bombs. Milne was seen crawling from the splintered wood and twisted iron of the wrecked house in torn pyjamas when startled neighbours arrived and taken to hospital suffering shock, abrasions and temporary deafness. The first neighbour to arrive, William McGee, heard Milne asking for a light and asking where his wife was. His 42-year-old wife had not been so fortunate. Her body had been thrown through the window by the force of the explosion landing near the front gate. It took a quarter of an hour by the distressed husband and neighbours to find her horribly mutilated body. Death must have been instantaneous. The children had followed their father out of the ruins, climbing over a fence into a neighbour's yard, calling for help in finding their mother, and were treated in hospital but had not been physically injured. Arthur Tucker, a youth sleeping next door, only 15 feet from the explosion, thought there had been an earthquake. His home swayed and rattled and dust and plaster rained down on him. Windows shattered here and in other nearby houses. Police converged on the home of their colleague and began a close examination of the ruins. Clothing inside had been peppered with tiny fragments the size of lead shot, but no trace of the explosive could be found at first. It was believed, however, that gelignite had been used. Hundreds of sightseers arrived and some stood for hours watching the investigation proceed. There had been several bombings in Melbourne since 1925, including an attempt to kill senior detective Bruce at Richmond with a jam tin bomb and a bomb that wrecked the home of senior detective Dunn at St Kilda on December 8, 1931. Despite property damage, nobody had been killed before. Freddie Milne was born in 1889 and had joined the police in October 1915. He spent time in the CIB, was noted for his athleticism and his prodigious memory of criminals' faces, their biographies and their associates. He and senior detective Lambell had done a lot of work in cleaning up the Narrows, a slum area rife with crime in Fitzroy, notable for being the haunt of Squizzy Taylor until he was killed during a shootout at Snowy Cutmores in 1927. Milne had come into contact with Taylor and his gang, and threats had been made to bomb his house or poison his milk, but nothing had come of it. 
On one occasion in 1922, Mill had been investigating counterfeiters producing fake banknotes. He had visited the public library to check a book on lithography, but was informed it was out on loan. He started to leave, then had a thought, and inquired who had the book. The borrower was linked to the counterfeiting, and the ring broken by a raid. Milne was transferred to Geelong in 1931, and had taken part in clearing up major crimes in the region. Threats had recently been made against Milne, which had worried his wife for the past three weeks. A man had even visited the house and uttered threats at the door. Because he couldn't be bought, Milne was often threatened. Just two days before she was killed, Amy had spoken to friends about her fears that something dreadful could occur. Three men, including one recently released from prison, were quickly detained and questioned, but soon released. The theft of 162 plugs of gel ignite and some detonators from the council quarry at Fyansford on the weekend was believed to be the source of the explosive used in the murder. It was thought that two or three packages, each containing 50 sticks of gel ignite, weighing five pounds, had been used. It was conjectured that the assailant arrived via back alleys on a bicycle. A man had been seen wheeling a bicycle along Retreat Road towards Manning Street at 2.40am. A solicitor who lived 50 yards south of the Milnes heard footsteps pass his gate, which he thought could be the milkman. The explosion was heard soon after. About six minutes after the explosion, a resident of Shannon Street saw a gig being driven quickly down the street. Mrs Milne was buried at East Geelong Cemetery on the 14th of July. A case which had been proceeding against Milne for malicious arrest and false imprisonment at the time was withdrawn by a man named Carr following the bombing. Questioned in his hospital bed, Franny Milne gave a vague description of a man he had seen standing outside the window just before the explosion. The man was in the shadow of the house and there was just the light of the fuse as it was lit by the man but based on the silhouette, a fourth man was taken in by police. This man had a hostile relationship with police and had been penalised a number of times by the courts in the previous year. Milne was still in hospital on the 16th of July, able to move only in great pain, when a fund was opened to aid the family. Norman Milne was sent to private boarding schools with the money raised. Freddie was released from hospital on the 17th of August but still attended hospital as an outpatient. When the inquest into the bombing was held in September, a minor mystery arose. The remains of the bedroom door had been found with the lock engaged. Milne denied he had locked it, and a locksmith testified that the explosion could have caused it to lock by itself. Milne believed that Edward George Carr, the man who had claimed that Milne had maliciously arrested him, was the man responsible for the bombing. Another man named Dave McIntosh had warned Milne on Thursday the 9th of July 1936 that he should withdraw fraud charges against Carr. McIntosh lived nearby, but Milne didn't think he was responsible. Another man named Walker, he believed, was capable of the act. Another man named Forbes was one of the men questioned, but he was not in Geelong on the night of the bombing. Another man named Taylor was also discounted. Carr gave evidence at the inquest that he had been home all night when the bombing took place. Carr had been convicted of minor offences on five occasions since 1927. He admitted that he had been arrested at Stall in 1932 with gel ignite and detonators in his car, but said they were not his. He was giving a miner a lift and they belonged to that man. Carr further said that he had not seen a man named Bob Scott for four years. Scott had been charged with blowing up railway stations. Another man named McInerney had threatened to put a charge of gelignite into Milne if he continued to annoy him in 1935, but he was not called to give evidence. It was pondered in court whether Amy had picked up the bomb in a futile attempt to throw it back outside when it went off. On the 15th of September, a finding of willful murder by person or persons unknown was handed down by the deputy coroner. Freddie Milne recovered from his injuries and returned to work, retiring in January 1950 at the rank of detective sergeant when he turned 60. 
He died at the age of 75 in 1964. Clarice, by then married with her own family, moved in and cared for her father in his later years. She said her father never really recovered from the violent death of his wife. Norman Milne, who served in the Navy at the end of World War II and later worked as a journalist, died in New South Wales on the 26th of July 1998, just months after his brother George died in Sydney on the 30th of December 1997. Valerie Clarice McLennan, formerly Silito, née Milne, died on the 24th of June 2006, aged 85. In 1946, George Edward Carr was questioned about the Barwon River murders of William Sheargold and Ernest Jew. On the 13th of March 1953, Carr, then aged 44, shot Ronald Lucas at a party at his house. In May of that year, Carr, now with 30 convictions to his discredit, was sentenced to seven years imprisonment for wounding with intent to inflict grievous bodily harm. In July of the same year, his 17-year-old son, John, was also in prison for housebreaking. On the 31st of May 2019, Amy Milne became the first non-police recipient of the Victoria Police Star, an award for police who suffer serious injury or death in the course of duty. Although officially unsold, the family of Amy Milne believed they knew the identity of her killer.